What happens in the sky affects life down here on Earth. The celestial compass shows you how and guides your way with astrology you can use from professional astrologer Kathy Beal. Every episode features her light-hearted practical forecasts and navigational tips, blended with humor, optimism, and a love of patterns, symbolism, and pop culture references. Kathy translates technicalities into concepts that apply to real life. You'll learn how the current moment ties to where we've been from the recent past to cycles that last happened years ago, and get a look at where we're heading. And much more, from special topics to special guests. The Celestial Compass, enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Here's your host, Kathy Beal. Beal welcoming you to Celestial Compass. And today we're going to look at an intersection of two of my favorite topics, astrology and film. And joining me is Frank Clifford, who is an astrologer, author, and principal of the London School of Astrology. He's been a consultant astrologer and palmist since 1989, and he teaches and writes about both subjects uh, online and in person, and his courses are available in Chinese, Japanese, and Turkish. Uh, wow. Okay. So for his free videos, articles, news, and live Q&As, visit LondonSchoolOfAstrology.com. Welcome, Frank. Hi there, Kathy. Great to see you again. I'm so glad you've come back. We, I enjoyed talking with you last year, and uh, I invited you specifically because you write a lot for The Mountain Astrologer uh, about things that involve um, Hollywood and films and the arts. And then you curated essentially an entire, let's see if I can get this so people can see it. Is this clear? Is it? No. Here we go. How's this? No. Not I should, working. I should have brought mine. <laughs> oh, well, entire issue of the Mountain Astrologer, uh, Astrology of Film. It was the Libra Equinox uh, September, November 2023 issue, which is still uh, available. Um, before we dive into any of the topics that were in that, I'm curious about your origin story. How did your love of film begin? Oh, well, that's interesting. Um, I've never given that much thought. I, I guess, um, uh, I, I loved film and TV and music and all those Neptunian delights for, I guess, since I was very, very young. Um, Going to the cinema when people used to go to the cinema was a great treat to just sit there and escape and just have uh, uh, real life or uh, faked or, or uh, you know, the, just the whole um, uh, beauty of seeing stories told. Um, always interested in directing. I did a, um, a media degree uh, with a, the intent of wanting to be a director oh. and then thought, hmm, I'd much rather be an astrologer. I'd much rather do uh, what I love doing and what comes naturally. And so I came away from the degree at university thinking, I'm not that impressed with what I'm learning and ended up just staying with what I truly love to do, which was the astrology and the palmistry at the time. Are there certain periods of uh, of film history that speak to you more than others? Um, I hmm, that's interesting. I, in some ways, I mean, I grew up in the nineteen eighties. Uh, I was born in seventy three, so I really came into film watching the big blockbusters, that mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Spielbergs, the Back to the Futures, the Indiana Joneses, and they were fine. But I had a calling for uh, for people dramas, you know, so going back to the 40s, going back to the 50s, where they made uh, adult dramas, one of my favorite films, All About Eve, just the, <laughs> yeah, you know, I just adore the interaction, the story, um, the human beings in the film. So I was never that interested in action, although I grew up in that time. It was uh, the people, the stories, biographies have always excited me, love learning astrology through biographies so biographical film biopics have always interested but i guess yeah i guess the 50s and 40s and um yes that that always um uh, spoke to me more yeah. 
Well, you've backed into an area that I'd like to talk about and probably inadvertently here, and that is there. Well, let's just start. Let's just start with Neptune. Would would you say that Neptune is a a significant influence on everything having to do with movies, film, TV? I yes, I think so. I uh, obviously, if you something I did for the magazine was I tracked Neptune moving through the signs, and it takes fourteen years to move through the signs, and it is the. Uh, Neptune represents whatever's fashionable in society. So it might be what people wear. When Neptune was in Capricorn in the 80s, so it was the shoulder pads, it was the power dressing, uh, it was the uh, dynasty in Dallas and all of those sorts of things. Um, so Neptune has a lot to do with fashion and a lot to do with uh, fashions in film. So Neptune moving into Aquarius in 1997, 98, for those 14 years, the first thing we see is uh, the Truman Show. I think it arrived almost the day that Neptune moved in. And to me, that was really heralding our fascination with reality TV, the idea of being the voyeur, very Neptune in Aquarius, where in a way the famous become ordinary and the ordinary become famous. And Aquarius is the sign of the ordinary man, the ordinary woman. The shadow side of that, of course, is Leo, which is all about being secretly being the star, grabbing the karaoke mic and impressing everybody in a in a drunken bar, perhaps. Uh, so um, Neptune to me is the the symbol of of uh, film, literally the projection of fantasy out right. and into our heads. Uh, but of course, and Neptune's. Um, uh, movement through the signs over the years. Uh, we really Neptune and Leo. We really get the MGM golden period. Uh, literally, the MGM, the lion, Neptune right. and Leo. Uh, and then it became more of a working man's um, project when Neptune moved into Virgo. Neptune moved into Libra. We start seeing more romance again. Neptune and Scorpio is the beginning of people really falling in love with horror movies. Uh, not my thing. Uh, and uh, and then Neptune in Sagittarius in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, we've got Close Encounters, we've got E.T., uh, Ray, you know, all the, the great um, mind-bending, what's out there, Sagittarius topics. So Neptune's journey simply through the science gives us a, a backdrop of um, the films that truly influence us. Yeah. They also that that journey also reflects what was going on with the film industry. It's fascinating to me that Neptune was in Gemini when the first films started being shot and distributed, and they were all very very short. Yes. And, and you would, and people. I think the was it the, the Great Train Robbery with the very end. The uh, the villain points his gun at the at the audience, and this was they thought it was real. It was, it was terrifying to them, but then as it as as Neptune progressed through the signs, what I find most fascinating is out of this when it hit um, Virgo, uh, the Hayes Code came into effect: rules and borders and boundaries, and this is the proper behavior, and you may not do this. I, that's just astonishing to me that that happened. That's right. I mean, Virgo is the sign of the editor, but it's also uh, the critic. And they seem to dominate, didn't they, for so many years with, with the Hayes Code. Uh, but going back to the end of the um, 19th century, when uh, Neptune and Pluto were in Gemini, we've really got the birth of modern media and the freedom that gives us, the ability to connect uh, for millions of people to sit and watch the same experience, like the Oscar show that uh, yeah, we've just we just had. Um, so fascinating, fascinating. The the media sign of Gemini being uh, not quite the talky, but certainly the scripts and the and the development of that. I think something I mentioned in the um, in the uh, issue and the film issue of back then it was about ninety seconds, the short film, and we've gone come full circle where a TikTok is ninety seconds now. So we live in a still in a very Gemini area. Say it fast, get the point across. And nowadays it's because of boredom and we want to flick through something. If something doesn't catch us in a few seconds, we're off. Uh, but back then it was it was the way to do it. It was exciting going to the flicks and uh, seeing a whole range of them. An interesting flick because it was the flickering light. 
that uh, that that refers to specifically. Um, shifting gears just a tiny bit, have you ever, or I would imagine, have you been caught or struck by uh, a movie that shows up that speaks to a moment in time or when something happens, a, a film comes out and you see a correlation between current transits. I'm thinking specifically of the Barbie movie opening on Venus in Leo retrograding last year and breaking every record imaginable for money and uh, views. That's right. Yes. I mean, you couldn't get more Venus in Leo than Barbie. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, and it seems to have rubbed some people up the wrong way and other people seem to think it's it's a wonderful moment in history. Uh, the um, Yes, yes. Um, so I haven't seen that, but certainly Venus and Leo would rec would uh, speak of that. I think probably becoming more aware of astrology in my teens and early 20s and then seeing films like Inception or Titanic and oh. seeing the connections there, the big blockbusters that everybody was talking about uh, and seeing, I think Inception was... Um, at the beginning when uh, of Neptune moving into Pisces again, where they you, you fall into the dream and then you have to wake yourself up. It was very Neptune in Pisces and Uranus in Aries. So the blockbusters usually speak to more than one planet. Uh, and because we're always dealing with the three outer planets, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto in different places, speaking of bigger themes in the world at that time. So yes, I, I must get around to seeing uh, to seeing Barbie. And the funny thing is the, uh, the issue of the TMA that you were talking about is um, I had a choice a couple of years ago of which issue to bring it out on, depending on the time. So I looked at the ephemeris and I thought Venus is going retrograde in Leo at the time of that uh, issue coming out. Sounds perfect for having another look. Retrograde is always about going back and reviewing and re-looking at something. So I uh, had no idea Barbie was coming out or that it would be uh, as as uh, um, important as it was at the time. But very interesting. Uh, and the the owner of the TMA laughed about that, about the timing of it, because it just seemed to click in well with all of a sudden cinema, Oppenheimer and uh, and Barbie being the two uh, the two films of the season. Yeah. That fit perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, sense of? I was I was kicking around in my mind trying to figure out why, like the Marvel universe and the DC universe, we've always had we've had superhero films for a long, long time since the '30s, probably even before that. But there have been big characters that have dominated uh, Captain America, Superman, there are all kinds of them. But but there's something. There feels to me like there's something super sized about what's going on with Marvel and DC films. Do you have any thoughts about well, that? I'm I'm going to sound cynical and say it's money. And I think with Neptune moving through Pisces, uh, it's all about the franchise. How much can you sell the mutable signs, Gemini, Virgo, Sagittarius and Pisces are all about repetition, uh, all about mm -hmm. how do you take the formula, redo it. Yeah, this is why all the serial killers are very mutable. Just keep doing what they're doing. And I think the, um, not that I want to uh, link the directors and producers to serial killers, but the mutability is about repetition. And so I'm not surprised that that happens now. Uh, I'll talk to you in a bit about Neptune moving into Aries. That might be very right. Yeah, that is very much on my, on my um, mind. But um, I also think just generally, uh, we we go to the cinema we flick on netflix we you know we we connect to movies because it resonates with something at the core of who we are it tells a story and so the sun in the chart our sun sign our birth sign star sign whatever you call it um the sun sign is really uh the essence of who we are and that's to do with being the hero and each one of us has that calling Joseph Campbell. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say him. I was just going to yeah, invoke Joseph him. Joseph Campbell uh, was the big one. And we know how many filmmakers that Joseph Campbell influenced, you know, everything from uh, the, the Star Wars work to uh, the Lord of the Rings to Superman. You know, um, th that is a theme that we see throughout history, the need to be the hero, the heroine, uh, the need to, in a way, discover who we were born to be. And that's what the hero does. 
and ideally we make choices that uh, that are um, a positive for us and other people. So I think the hero thing will remain as long as there's there are stories to tell. It's a bit like Mercury is the planet of telling the story. Mm -hmm. Neptune will be projecting it and Jupiter will be promoting it. Uh, but the sun is the core, that that individual life story. So I think that will always appeal, regardless of where the planets are. Yeah. There just seem to be stretches of time with dominant, dominant themes. A lot of people um, will refer to uh, the 70s coming out of uh, the films coming out of the United States in the 70s as being like a great, a, very, a great, great period. And there were things that would hit social justice or big issues that people didn't uh, otherwise want to talk about. Uh, some really, really major things. And um, I don't know, I could see the Neptune and Sagittarius being part of that. That also weirdly coincided with um, cowboy craze for some reason. And uh, I mean, urban cowboy was part of it, but it was, it was bigger than that. And um, Renaissance festivals taking off in the United States, which fits in a, in a very kind of weird, let's all just go play dress up in the forest, which seems to be in its own renaissance these days uh, with a different vibe. Um, well, I think I link the cowboy to Sagittarius. Right. Uh, in both way, both meanings. So, I mean, we've got, as a Brit, looking at America with potentially Sagittarius rising, depending on which astrology you, you follow, um, it's, it's the cowboys and Indians. It's that, that what we grew up playing or watching on the screen. And so cowboy is very intricately part, uh, connected to America's Sagittarius ascendant. Um, cowboys, on the other hand, are people that are con artists, what we call cowboys. Um, that's the other side of Sagittarius, taking advantage of people's uh, generosity or opportunity. But yeah, I would look at cowboys as being very Sagittarian. But at the same time, you've got um, the Godfather in the 70s. You've got, uh, I, yes, I think you're absolutely right. It's the it's um, one of it's the modern golden age of film, mm -hmm. and I find myself watching the Oscars every now and then. Um, I used to stay up live and watch it, you know, watch it live and all the way through the night over here. But um, I find it's very easy to forget who won last year, uh, which films are interesting. But when you go back and you watch the winners in the in the earlier decades really from the 40s onwards, but particularly 70s and 80s, um, there are people that uh, really have stamped their personality, stamped their mark, uh, and they seem to be, I guess, legendary figures, uh, living or, or otherwise. So uh, it doesn't have that same uh, appeal. It feels rather watered down these days, in my opinion. Uh, but there's still an excitement with it. And I still love watching the red carpet, who you might see. And it, it brings me back to the early days of watching them in the 1980s. Uh, so that was always an exciting time. The Neptunian glamour of it comes through. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. yes. This is a special moment. Right. Yeah. Um, the early 90s, I think, was the genesis of another turning point in how we relate to all of this. The um, um, Uranus and uh, Neptune, or Neptune-Uranus conjunct in the early 90s, yeah. seems to, that was the doorway to the, the web becoming something, the World Wide Web, now the internet, uh, information highway, whatever we have, many things we called it then, but that has started changing and in a weird way, Uranus democratizing, uh, being creators. We'd see that on TikTok and on Instagram is turning into a mini TikTok. Like, oh, I don't want to see this stuff. There's a there's a video everywhere I turn. I'm sick of the reels. Make it quit. Um, sorry, there's my uh, my own little soapbox here. But uh, there was there's one article uh, in here, and I regret uh, I, I should look up the person's name. Someone wrote about the birth of Netflix, uh, growing out of that particular uh, conjunction. And although Netflix started as a way for you to get movies in your home via CDs, it then pioneered being able to watch media online, which is now multiplicity. Neptune and Pisces, many different avenues. Everybody's got their own streaming service, and it's becoming kind of ridiculous but uh 
Have you thought about that particular aspect? Yes, yes. Well, it, it was an article. Um, Stephanie James was the Thank author you. of that. And um, uh, I've known Stephanie many years. She's been at my school. She now teaches occasionally for the school. And uh, uh, I love that idea of exploring that because it really, in the early 90s, the internet was gifted to the world. It didn't, um, I know it's cost us in different ways over the years, but it's um, it was gifted. And I think it's, I think such a quantum leap, which is probably a great phrase for uh, Uranus Neptune, uh, quantum leap for people who were born around that time or after of how they digested, ingested what we're what we look at and what we consider film. And yes, democracy certainly, and also it gives us control. And I was um, just talking to my mum yesterday about uh, uh, she was saying how she hated waiting for four episodes like every Monday and have to wait four weeks to see the next episode because she'll head over to her um, her sky or whatever she uses and uh, and be able to see four episodes in a row and then be able to pause it if she wants, come back to it later. And we've been spoiled by that immediacy, but it gives us control. And I think that's what we want. It has been flooded, as you say, and maybe Neptune in Pisces is, it's like, well, how many streaming services do I need and how many can I actually watch? Uh, it feels almost a tsunami of opportunity to buy and 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 uh, access more things. I also think the, the great trend at the moment, of course, is, uh, or maybe it's just me, I don't know. Uh, the great trend is um, uh, the constant uh, flood of uh, true crime documentaries. You know? And uh, Netflix themselves are a bit guilty of making something six episodes when it could be four. <laughs> and you sit there and you think, okay, this is the filler episode where can you just get to the point? Uh, but it's um, there's a huge, just so much. It's almost, um, I mean, it's intoxicating in that Pisces way, in that Neptunian way. It's addictive. And we binge and we might spend the whole day, instead of going for a walk or chatting with each other, we're, we're watching and we're absorbing. And it's so easy to just press next episode, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does it for us. Uh, so times have changed, but it is really that seed. And I think it comes down to uh, just experiencing the world so differently as you know, and I think people born around that time, and a lot of my students were, originally they popped up, uh, or not originally, maybe in the last 10 years, were more 89, 92, now they're much younger. And I've got students being born in like uh, 2005, which is, uh, it's a leap of consciousness there, trying to imagine 2005 people uh, studying astrology. Um, but the early 90s seemed to be this, uh, this powerful intake. And now a lot of my students are students of that generation, using astrology online, um, seeing the world in such different ways. And hopefully they'll be the wakers up or the shakers and they'll be the, in a way, the salvation of the future. Um, or they'll also be the ones that don't want to work, uh, don't want to be activated but you know there's it's the millennials are a bunch of fascinating brilliant people born around that time um and the flip side of that is that half of the generation might just simply veg out sitting watching netflix until they expire you know <laughs> it's a it's a mixed bag as it always would be yeah off topic but of interest here one of the recent, one of the tarot decks that has been given to me recently is the millennial tarot and it's got avocados on the back of it and everything, every single card is absolutely self-evident. One of them is IDK. I don't know. <laughs> you just, you know, it has all the um, shorthand notions that you run into online for communication, only it's in visual and deck form. I like to take it to parties with people significantly younger than I am. They resonate with it. It's very fun. Um, don't I, think, I, I think it's playful, but it also it's important not to dumb down that generation or think they're just the generation of internet and, uh, and social media because um, there's going to be a point where 
we're going to we'll as older generations will recognize why they're here what they can be doing for us uh so yes i'm intrigued by that and um i'm the first to think yeah i can't wait to learn from them uh i can't wait to for them to inspire me and they're already doing that of course as students but it would be interesting to be aware of that as, as a generation yeah. they'll they'll network differently than the earlier generations did that is for certain um there's so many ways we could go from that but we're coming up towards uh, a break so i don't want to uh dive into that uh during the break uh, please think if there are any uh, particular clusters of time or films that you associate with. I mean, like when I'm watching, sometimes I'll see the, something on television or on a streaming service and it'll crystallize in my mind as a depiction of a transit that's happening right now, or I'll be compelled to go look at what was going on with in a biopic, for example, what, what in that person's chart is being activated at this moment that suddenly they're back in the limelight. So um, if you, have any of those kinds of notions floating around your head, see if they can come up and we will take our first break, our only break right now. So hang around people, we've got lots more to talk about. Ohm Times TV. Want help with your own celestial compass? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net for Astro Insight forecasts for each week, month, and new and full moon. Want to explore the personal impact? Make a decision? Understand another person? <laughs> it is possible. Click the services tab to book a personal session with me. That address again? Empowermentunlimited.net Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a, a mile, mile in my shoes. shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. I see I knocked my camera during the break. Uh, this is Kathy Beal, and we're talking today with Frank Clifford, astrologer, author, and principal of the London School of Economics. And we have been talking about astrology and film. Um, I had earlier given the example of the Barbie movie premiering with Venus retrograding in Leo. Um but also there are, there are times when something will come out and I will be immediately struck that perhaps the actor is having a mass, something that's really important, like Colin Firth in the King's speech, having his Chiron return about the King's Chiron return. Uh, are there any examples that occur to you of a, an interplay between current skies and stuff on film? Oh, I think um, there are a huge number, aren't there? Um, I have to, really think about them. I was looking at the chart of Robert Downey Jr., of course, who's just oh. won the Oscar, and uh, he's just having his Saturn return this week. Uh, and looking back 29 years ago, which is what we do when we're, <laughs> when we're astrologers and try to make connections, um, was the time where he was really at his peak, but then went off the rails. And 
I would imagine that Saturn in Pisces, his Saturn return now, is is um, time for redemption in a way, a sense of feeling coming back to a community that has probably already been always been there for him, but perhaps um, uh, the self destructive side was. Uh, uh, was was too strong, but it, so he's sort of come back home in a way. It was really interesting to think of that. Um, but one of the other areas that really interests me is um, why certain actors are picked for certain uh, roles. Uh -huh. And I've written about that in the past, where uh, there's what we call direct synastry, you know, inter aspects between them. So uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Aries um, uh, played uh, Charlie Chaplin, of course, famously in his 20s, who's another Aries, and they have lots of connections in their charts. So it feels like um, even without understanding it, uh, directors pick the right people or, or producers pick the right people for roles that absolutely resonate on a celestial level, on a planetary level. So I'm always fascinated to see who played who and why not somebody else as well and the timing as well so there's that's a whole field of research which really fascinates me um and i would say that it's a there's a resonance there with a particular sign it might be your ascendant sign or your sun sign uh that uh attracts somebody wanting to play you or vice versa you know that sense of really um really connecting with the essence of somebody. Uh, and many years ago, one of the first jobs I ever got out um, uh, uh, when I was out of university was um, a director hired me for, um, he said, I gather you can do this. And I said, sure, I can. You know, I'm 21 and uh, 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 bolder than perhaps I am now, maybe. Um, and said, I've got four actors in mind for this role. And it was for the role of Janice Joplin. Uh, and uh, which one would be best astrologically? So I had a really good look at them and picked the one that he also picked, interestingly, uh, that he had a, a, a sense about. Uh, so he was very pleased with that. But of course, as as always often happens with film, you know, things don't get made. They end up getting repurchased. They become something else. So um, that particular project never manifested, but it was great fun to do. It was really great to to look at the charts and to see and to discuss the the connections, the resonance between between the charts. So, yeah, any more jobs like that, I'm open for that sort of thing. That's great. Uh -huh. Hey, world, listen. <laughs> I love those sorts of jobs. Yeah, cosmic LinkedIn here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, funnily enough, a few years ago, I had a phone call out of the blue. Um, an actor that was um, at the at the awards just last week. They said we want to give a reading to a to an actor that's just won an Academy Award. Would you come and see them in their London hotel? And that's the sort of thing you you don't want to say no to because it's great fun. And uh, so that was a that was a fun a fun afternoon. Uh, but again, uh, working for famous people, doing charts for people in the, in the public eye can be more difficult than regular people simply because they don't quite trust that what you're talking about hasn't been looked up on Google. Right. <laughs> so you, you sort of have to jump through hurdles or really say, look, I don't know much. Of, I haven't read up on you, but I'm looking at your chart. And uh, if, if you can be not put off by that, you can get to the heart of the chart and and work with them like they're a human being instead of somebody that's been uh, in all the uh, tabloids for the last few years, that sort of thing. So it's always... Um, that's always a challenge, but again, interesting jobs. And we astrologers love anything that takes us out of the uh, the regular, of the routine. <laughs> I I have something like that coming up involving a, a silent film director. Uh, a relative of his is uh, putting together a documentary about some very strange things that happened after his death, and I using. Uh, progressions and transits i think i've figured out i've at least identified the week during which his grave was broken into so and that's pretty cool to be able to do this kind of thing yeah yep yep <laughs> it's also pretty cool to meet somebody who's related to someone that you admire like wow this is so neat uh but i digress um Let's talk about where things are going because you we've talked a little bit about we've talked a lot about Neptune and it will soon be changing sign and it will be changing sign in 
uh, in a way that will be very, very different than what we've been undergoing. And that we'll also be meeting up with Saturn at some point uh, after it does that. And that is uh, Neptune moving into Aries. Do you have a sense how we're going to go from this multiplicity? Um, I, I don't see it continuing. I don't see the financial viability of, of 50,000 um, streaming services and Neptune going into Aries has an awful lot to do with the individual, uh, excuse me, the individual calling the shots. Yes. That's my feeling about it. If we look at what happened when Uranus moved into Aries, um, 2010, around that time, what we saw a lot more of was the sort of <clears throat> DIY in your bedroom, creating music, creating something, you know, so um, with music, often music is is more instant it's often for it's often ahead of film in mm -hmm. some ways uh so looking back then watching people making music uh and being able to sell it on the internet but just doing it from their bedroom for instance feels very aries being in charge uh, it's expressing your individuality so i imagine when neptune moves in a couple of years in into into aries we'll have that sense of filmmakers uh, creating their own work, uh, back to the auteur, back to the idea of uh, yes, I made this and I edited it in my in my backyard, that sort of thing. So I think it's going to be less of the dynamic, huge sense of everybody needs to put in tens of millions of dollars and that whole game that's played. And I think it will come back more to the individual. The other thing happening, of course, I mean, we've got major, major shifts and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll be talking about them uh, for for the next few years on your show. And one of the other things, apart from Pluto moving into Aquarius, um, Uranus moves into Gemini. Mm -hmm. And what I'm fascinated with, and I'm, I'm going to be in America at NORWAC, the um, conference in uh, Seattle in May, I'm going to be talking about uh, freedom of speech and Uranus. And I'm going to have to tread a little, little bit carefully so nobody decides to cancel me or uh, shoot me on stage or anything like that. Uh, I better not be saying those things. Um, and Uranus in Gemini, uh, from about a year, a year and a half from now, I forget the exact date, uh, the big battle, the big war is going to be on words. We're already seeing uh, books being taken off the shelf, banned for some reason, altered because there are things that are offensive about them or appearing to be offensive to people. And I'm fascinated with that because we need Uranus. We need to stay offensive rather than cushioned. It's a bit like if you've got a pain, do you really want to just drug yourself into a stupor or do you want to just feel it, work through it and get through it? You know. So there's something about um, numbing people's senses that we're getting with Neptune in Pisces and this sort of right or wrong that feels very Uranus and Taurus right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, if you're offended, switch off. If you're offended, speak up. But if we take out the offense and we end up editing uh, books and things from the past um, and we end up canceling people over that, it says something about not looking at the problem and not finding a solution, just simply eliminating the issue. So uh, that's a, that's my soapbox moment, Kathy. Um, so I'm <laughs> I'm watching that at the moment take place and thinking that's bound to appear in film. That's mm -hmm. bound to come up where we're already getting that with AI and Pluto moving into Aquarius. But in mm -hmm. terms of what people say or allowed to say, it's going to be such a major issue. Uranus is in Gemini in the US chart as well, um, along with Mars. <clears throat> and it's going to be a big issue in America, definitely. We know that already. It's, it's brewing. Uh, but it's going to be a fundamental issue in film of, uh, you know, is that going to be cancelled before we get a chance to hear it? I want to be provoked sometimes, you know. Uranian people and Uranus are here in our lives to remind us what it is we don't find acceptable. And if you numb them, silence them, throw them away, block them, cancel them, stick them in a cupboard, um, there's uh, we're almost looking for trouble. <laughs> you know? And the interesting thing is the last time Uranus was in Gemini, the final week 
as it was at 29 Gemini, right at the end of the sign, the, um, the book 1984 was published. So we're coming back to, and it's being used, the idea of being woke, too woke, not woke enough, all of those issues, all of those words are fascinating. And they're all Uranian words, being woke, woken up. Uh, so we're at a time where Neptune in Aries is going to say, hang on a minute, what about the individual? What about fighting for something instead of just letting it disappear or, or muting it, which is what Pisces can do, or ignoring the issue? And Uranus and Gemini will come along and say, we've got to fight for the right to keep expressing ourselves. That's my take on it. And maybe seven years down the line, it will be a very different issue, or it might be the hot topic of, of this decade and next. Maybe, maybe we'll see. What do you think about that? Well, I I hadn't thought of in those terms. They make complete sense to me. I also think of the multiplicity that is inherent in Gemini. And we already have m multiple versions of things passing as truth and reality flying around now. Will that get even more? Perhaps. Uh, will It'll be loud. It'll be noisy, <laughs> seems to me. And uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. Maybe um, learning more languages will become uh, more the norm uh, because I, I, this is from being in the center of the United States and then being thrown in a school in another country when I was a preteen. And it, it just made me very, very aware, aware that there are many, many ways to look at the world, to experience, and that language and language holds values. And if you learn another language, you inherently pick up a different way of looking at the world. Um, and so I wonder if there's something with that. I don't know. There might be. Maybe, uh, maybe all wars will be fought with information uh, during that time, which I think has been going on already. Yes. But that could be another part of it as well. Indeed, yes. And I think film will reflect that. I like the duality of that. It's um, uh, I'm already starting to see it where uh, two languages are in the same series. Uh, and it's not yes. necessarily subtitled always, but you get a sense of what it might be like. What used to make me laugh about watching some of the sci-fi is that anybody that landed on, you know, the um, Enterprise or, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, whatever, they all spoke usually in a British accent uh, and uh, and sp speaking English. It was always very funny to see that. Uh, so maybe there'll be uh, just an awareness of, yeah, uh, uh, you'll get the gist of it. Even if you don't know the exact words, we're going to give you two languages sometimes in film on TV and you, you'll get the essence of it and maybe you'll you'll learn something along the way. And probably things will be even shorter. Maybe we'll go back to uh, a, a lot of more when the film first came out and it was very, very short. And we're already seeing this with with reels on Instagram and with TikTok, the attention span just being shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah. Uh, perhaps that'll be part of it. And there's one other thing that occurs to me. I don't remember who said this, but during an acceptance speech at the, uh, at the Oscars, there was one person who said, instead of putting some huge amount of money into one film, why not split it into 10 smaller budget films? So like instead of a hundred thousand million, a hundred million dollar budget, how about 10, $10 million budget films? Yeah. And yeah. that could very well come with the shifts that we've been talking about. Of, uh, sounds like a good idea and it uh but it feels like yes things have become monsters they've become too big too much money and with that uh yes special effects and you know we appreciate when it's done well uh but human stories are always going to be uh what we what we need as well and those can be very lo low budget uh it's some um, you know, there's just a it's it's a business, isn't it? It's show business, and the actors over the years have understood that they can demand a lot of money, and why not? Uh, if they can get that, and somebody's willing to pay it, hell, you know, queue up and and demand it too. Uh, so, but yes, it has distorted. It. It's become an albatross. It's become, uh, I think, a little bit too much. Well, I've just had another thought. I wonder if there'll just be more and more strikes with Pluto in Aquarius and Uranus in Gemini, 
of collective saying, hey, you can't, you people up there at the top, you can't take it. Yeah. Well, I think the strikes are interesting because, uh, again, they're a reflection of that tail end of Pluto and Capricorn. Mm-hmm. That whether you want to call it the patriarchy, whether you want to call it the establishment, um, however you want to view it, things are changing at the top. And Pluto and Aquarius, the best side of it, for the good 15 years it's there, will be you know, power to the people, the sense of understanding that we actually have uh, voting power. We have we have power to say, we don't want this, and we vote with our feet. We vote with our, with in many ways. Uh, at the same time, of course, there's the idea that one world order, one government, all the scary things that uh, Big Brother, all the big things where every time you visit something or even speak into your phone or uh, they know what to sell to you. So yeah, there's, there's a lot more that, that will accompany Pluto and Aquarius, I think, as well. Yeah, scary stuff. So going back to film or movies, uh, the pandemic was a factor in people not going to theaters much anymore uh, or at all. It was They were really hard to even get into. But now that movie going is, is more and more possible. Uh, I am finding that I don't go all that often. I go if it's a film that um, I don't trust I'm going to be able to find on streaming if it's really small or if it has a if it's something about seeing it in, on a very large screen, but very rarely do you have the experience of a huge bunch of people in one room uh, yeah. watching a film anymore. And I think based on other things we've talked about that your own uh, relationship with movie going has undergone a change. I think so. And I would say the smart thing that they've done in a lot of movie theaters is to make the chairs more comfortable to make them more like we can have at home or even better than at home. So you can lie down almost. You've you've got areas for food. In some cinemas, they actually bring food to you now. You don't just get these. You don't have to, like, carry everything to your seat and drop half the drink and and popcorn. So they've turned it into a theater, cinema, stroke, restaurant, stroke. uh, And they're, they're the clever people doing that because... Do you, I mean, in England, I was saying this before we started, you know, in England, you'd you'd get into an old uh, cinema and your feet would almost stick to the floor just from moving from one side to the other because of all the crap that's been but dropped there over the months and years. And I, I was saying to you before, you know, I've been in cinemas where there have been rats running around uh, looking for food. So, and uh, you don't really want rats in the dark unless you're what, you know, unless you're part of a Halloween movie and you're Jamie yeah, no. <laughs> screaming the place down. Um, so, um, I think what they've done is to turn it from being quite a grotty experience into something more comfortable. And uh, that is the best way to go. And remember the 2020 conjunction of Saturn and Pluto was in Capricorn, Mm -hmm. uh, which of course spoke about the lockdown, the breakdown of society, the rules, all of those Capricorn things. But anytime you have major planetary shifts, we always look at the opposite sign too, don't we? And what it really affected was the home. Cancer is yes. yes. the opposite sign of Capricorn. So um, in a way, it was the inevitable dying off of us wanting to go to work, wanting to work in an office, wanting to leave the home. And so that idea of being you know, Pluto and Aquarius now, we're all going to be connected, but we're all going to be distant. And the young generation don't want to go into work. They want to be able to click on and do a bit of work at 11 a.m. and then work in their own time. And things have changed on that. So it's not just been the crisis and the illness that came with that and and the panic and all the different terrible things that resulted, the businesses lost. It's also encouraged people to do what they were naturally almost looking for permission to do, and that is to stay at home, uh, watch cinema in their living rooms, um, project it. I moved house last year and we have, um, uh, on the top floor, we have a room that was uh, 
used to have a big TV. In fact, the people who owned this house had TVs in every room, which made me laugh because I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I like a bit of quiet sometimes, you know, <laughs> if you can believe that. And um, so we ended up getting a projector. So we've got a little projector in between the two of us, our two comfortable seats, and that projects a huge screen. Instead of getting something that could easily break or the cleaner comes around and accidentally knocks it and it's cracked. So uh, things are changing and people are becoming sort of kings of their castle again when it comes to movies and cinema and home entertainment in a way. And we've all been edging towards that. But I think that conjunction really was the death knell. It was that final nail in the coffin of going to work and having to uh, sit in an office. And I mean, it's still there, but it's just it's changed. And I think it's the birth of that change, really. And and to do with cinema and movie theatres as well, being horrible and grotty. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny to hear you say this, because it was in London that I had my first experience of buying a movie ticket with an assigned seat. That was for Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits. That gives my age. And... Um, also, uh, having people walking up and down the aisles selling um, snacks. That was the first time I experienced that. It's almost like there was a the trolley was going around. Uh, well, they still, they still do that in theaters, but in uh, cinemas, you don't get that in cinemas. But I remember them, you know, with the trolleys or, or the everything on their shoulders, uh, drinks, lemon drinks and orange drinks and stuff. Yes, that was great fun. But no, theaters still do that. That's always that's not the movie theaters. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, things are just going to continue evolving. It seems uh, probable, no, no change in that. And uh, uh, I suspect that there's going to be quite a quickening, probably 2025, 2026, suddenly massive, massive change very, very rapidly. So even what we're experiencing right now, unlikely to still be the situation um, in two years even. Mm -hmm. would you, you would agree with that then? I think so. And the planets are moving from the nighttime signs or feminine signs, uh, whatever, however you want to label them, because uh, we no longer live in a binary world. Uh, that's what we're we're aware of at the moment. Um, but in astrology, they're either masculine or feminine or day or night. And the three outer planets are moving from the so-called feminine signs to masculine signs. So uh, the meaning of that is in the sense of more out there, more dynamic, more obvious change than the sort of introverted inner landscape that has been chain, been in the process for so many years with the with the feminine signs being activated. So it's a dynamic time, and I hope people find their identities again in many ways. You know, and uh, it's yeah, yeah. Pis the Neptune in Pisces has been such an interesting journey of searching for something yeah um steering clear of labels because that's virgo the opposite of pisces uh and trying to work out what it is who am i what do i like where am i going has been the big um news story is the big social change uh in the last 13 years really the last 12 13 years so um but with aries it feels like there's more of a a statement a definitive or some sort of definite statement about that um but each one flips into the next you know this is the zodiac we learn the zodiac by watching the planets move through the signs uh, and it's only with the nodes do we watch the zodiac uh, go backwards you know and learn through the other way but generally speaking aquarius is followed by pisces and that's followed by aries and we learn so much about um who we are and and what we're here to do through that, through those ingresses, yeah. So exciting times. I'm never afraid of anything. You know, when Neptune moved into Pisces 12, 13 years ago, people were saying, oh, it's going to be a much more spiritual time. And the cynic in me just thought, you know what? Yes, hopefully. But at the same time, where there's faith and hope, there are scoundrels who are trying, uh -huh. to, trying to rob you of that. You know, there's always the flip side of, of things. So and there are um, weed shops everywhere now. <laughs> <laughs> get, get by the smell of everything, yes. Um, so it's so interesting how that, uh, I, I would say to everyone, don't be afraid of that. I had an email the other day from 
uh, a potential client saying, I'm scared to death of Pluto moving into my sign. And she must have read something oh, yeah. stupid, something a little bit ignorant or ill-informed uh, online. You know, I always say free content is often content free and you have to be careful what you read. And she was terrified of what Pluto might mean. And one of the first things I do with my students is to say, well, go back and look at how much Pluto you've already had. And you're right. still here. <laughs> right. You're still here. So um, how bad do you think it might be? You know, um, so for me, I'm excited to embrace all the new the new ingresses of Pluto into Aquarius, Neptune into Aries, Uranus into Gemini. Um, it's going to be a, a fascinating time. And what you do with it is down to you. I'm not and waiting. I, unfortunately, yeah. I need to wrap up now. I'm so <laughs> glad. Got, this has been fascinating. I always love talking with you. Please tell people where they can find you. Oh, they can go to londonschoolofastrology.com and uh, sign up there and we get lots of freebies and articles and uh, all sorts of things. So they're very welcome to see me there. Well, I thank you very, very much. It's always a pleasure talking with you. And everyone, look for the forecasts. My forecasts are at omtimes.com and my site, empowermentunlimited.net. And uh, when you go to the movies now, think about what does this have to do with what's going on astrologically? Could be an interesting uh, exercise for you. So thanks again, Frank. Thanks, Kathy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.